Hello and welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on which time zone you are in. Thank you for joining us live for today's MAI webinar, Rules for Successful Publishing in Any Context. This is Ramon Rocha of MAI greeting you from Illinois with our speaker today, Randall Pay Leitner, who is also joining us from Illinois. Randall, I'll formally introduce you later, but please say a quick greeting to our audience. Good morning, everyone. I've uh, been looking forward to being with you all for, for many days and weeks, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Ramon, for having me, and uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Randall, for your time. You've reserved this time to lead us today. Thank you. We are glad to see 106 from 38 countries representing all five continents register for today's webinar. Several of you come from countries where it is difficult to publish Christian books. If all right with you, go ahead and type on the chat from where you're coming from. I saw Reggie said he's from Mexico. Yes, Jenny is from Thailand. Um, who else? Hankuri is from Nigeria. Uh, Romualdo is from the Philippines. So is Don Tan. Yes, thank you everyone. From Indonesia, Wendy. Nora from Madagascar. Wow. And yeah, Tim. Thornborough and Lizzie from the UK, uh, Rachel, Singaporean in Mexico. That's interesting. Thank you so much for being here. We are truly global and thank you. Well, either your market is small or the majority of your people are antagonistic to the Christian faith. And there's a or there's a general lack of interest in reading or families simply don't have the money to buy Christian reading materials, or your publishing capital is always lacking. There are a lot of challenges global Christian publishers face, but here you are, God has called you to write and publish the hope in Christ, working very hard to reach your readers, trusting that the Holy Spirit will use your materials to bring transformation in your readers' lives, that more people will know Jesus as Lord and Savior through your books, believers grow more mature in him, churches grow, God's kingdom expands for his glory. We trust that today's webinar will be helpful to you, acknowledging that we only have 60 minutes to share sound publishing principles and to hopefully bring encouragement to you as you do your best to be faithful in your ministry and business of Christian publishing in your context. I think we will have to define, Randall, we have to define what is successful publishing later. To our participants, please engage with us via the chat or for your comments and use the Q&A. And Randall said, it's all right to be inter interrupted if you have a question, please go ahead and, and we can interrupt Randall in his presentation. Our presenter today is Randall Pay Leitner. Randall is the publisher at Moody Publishers in Chicago. He has 18 years of experience working in a well-known and trusted 140-year-old Christian publishing house. He has learned and done marketing, copywriting work, developmental editing, acquisitions, serving in different leadership roles at Moody Publishers over the years. We are so privileged to have Randall as our speaker today. Thank you, Randall. So please take it away. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Ramon. Thank you so much. What an honor to be here. I. Uh... I'll be honest and say that I started tearing up a little bit when I saw the chat fill with all the names of people from all over the world and all of you all who are serving so faithfully, even considering the different time zones and the spin of the earth as we're 
maybe going to bed soon or waking up early or maybe you just had lunch. Wherever you are, God bless you and your work. God bless you and what you're up to. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, one note about me before I, I jump right in, you should know that right at the top of my notes for this talk, I write, talk slowly, because I have a temptation and a hindrance to normally talk really fast. So I will attempt to <laughs> to speak more slowly so as to be understandable, because I know that myself, I have a difficult time understanding myself sometimes. But like Ramon said, my name is Randall. I'm going to give you a little bit about me and where I work. I, I imagine some of you might have heard of Moody and, and, and what we've done over the years, but uh, uh, really, I'm just a person who's in a long line of amazing people who've worked in, in Christian publishing and, and at Moody. I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'll talk a little bit about how to be a good publishing partner. I'm presuming many of you are already wonderful publishing partners to those that you serve. And as I thought about how I could serve you all, I wanted to just clearly state what I thought were the best uh, values that a publisher could have. Uh, then, then my main area of expertise over the last 18 years has been acquisitions. So acquiring new books, working with authors. So I'll share a little bit about what an acquisitions editor actually does. And then lastly, talk about effective publication team and publishing processes. And that's really uh, where we kind of get into publishing excellence, which I hope is something that is uh, is valuable for you all. And as I was speaking with Ramon before I started, before this morning, when we were testing out the technology and everything, I said, goodness, this could go for four hours and you all could teach me uh, even more than I could possibly teach you. Uh, so as Ramon said, please do interrupt in the chat or in the Q&A, however you'd uh, best like to communicate. If I don't see it right away, I'll try to get to it. I don't mind uh, being interrupted in the middle. Uh, I don't think anyone wants to hear me speak just over and over again, right in a row. So feel free to interrupt. <clears throat> and then at the end, there will be some time for Q&A too. So as Ramon said, I'm Randall. I'm the publisher I'm, uh, at Moody in Chicago, working alongside acquisitions and marketing and sales and editorial and creative. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a husband to my wife, Rachel, our two sons. I'm a brother and friend and a reader. Over the last 18 years at Moody, I've done uh, mostly acquisitions and editorial work and, and worked with a bunch of other departments too. I love good books. Goodness, I could talk for hours about books and how important they are and how much they matter. And even how uh, how I believe everyone gets better off and is smarter when they read more books. <laughs> I know I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but I just want to come at you with the reality that of the importance of books and how the work that we're doing really does matter. Uh, publishing, book publishing, as you all know, is an ever-changing and amazing industry. I was sitting back thinking of things that have changed or that are off that were off the radar or below the radar when I started in publishing in 2005. So just since 2005, here are things that that either got started or were barely starting then. Ebooks, social media, online retailing uh, as the primary source for buying for many publishers, smartphones, tablets, blogs, print on demand streaming video, even the words swipe, tag, and follower all meant something completely different even just 18 years ago. So we all exist in a 500-year-old industry, maybe even longer, longer ago than that, but with the printing press, let's say that's when book publishing really started. And just in the last 20 years, it's changed more than it had in the previous 400. I'm very convinced of that. We are in a brave new world here. Publishing is always changing. No matter the context, my favorite part of book publishing is that books can go places that people can't. Books get handed out. They're given as gifts. They are easily printed. They can stand on their own without somebody there uh, explaining it. And they change lives. So real quick here, just a little bit about my context. Uh, as I know you all are in your context, there's there's not much more we can uh the only way can, we can really reach our audience and our readers is if we understand where we are and where they are. So real quick, about 140 years ago, D.L. Moody, a well-known evangelist and honestly one of the most well-known people in the whole world at that point, uh, knelt on a small plot of land in a poverty-stricken area of Chicago and asked God to build for land to build a Bible school. And then a few years later, he was in a bookstore in Wisconsin, just north of Chicago, and asked 
the owner something like, what have you in the way of books for young people to show and share the gospel with them? And they didn't have anything. So in the late 1800s, Moody started what eventually became Moody Publishers uh, as a part of the Moody Bible Institute here in Chicago. So we have several thousand students who are learning and growing uh, uh, in the gospel work to be future missionaries and workers in the church um, and around the world. Uh, and, and also Moody's other two main ministries are publishing, book publishing, and, and radio broadcast ministry as well. The goal for us was then and is now to still to get inexpensive, reliable, gospel-centered Christian material into the hands of as many people as possible. Uh, and what you're looking here in this picture on the left, originally our, our books were all delivered by fleets of horse-drawn wagons. Uh, and even though our delivery systems have changed a little bit, uh, our mission remains the same. So uh, even whether the economy's up or down, whether there's... Uh, persecution or difficulty, whether there's printing press issues, whether there's a global pandemic. Uh, people uh, need high quality, inexpensive Christian materials out in the world. Uh, and like Moody said, souls were at stake. And it's still true today, just as much as it was then. Um, uh, since then, we've distributed about 300 million books in 71 languages in over 130 countries. Uh, some of those are books that we've published here and, and uh, translated elsewhere. Others are books that we've partnered with authors in other countries and then had translated back into English or, or uh, into multiple languages. Um, I could tell you more about other books that we've done. I, I won't go into that now. Time is short. <clears throat> um, our mission, emblazoned on the glass, when you come into our office, while there is yet time, we resource the church's work of discipling all people. And then our vision, the gospel that's available for every person. That's what we'd like to see. We'd like to see that be available. However, they're getting it through earbuds or on paper or on a tablet, the gospel available for every person. So looking at these three pictures, you've got a horse pulling books from 120 years ago, uh, a bookshelf here in my office on the bottom there. That's just a sampling of our most recent titles. And then here on the right is our city, Chicago. I love Chicago, greatest city in the world. Uh, and it's important to know where we are so that we can know how to best serve uh, those that we're serving. If you don't know where you are, it's going to be difficult to find where other people are. So jumping right in, uh, how to be a good publishing partner. What does that look like? I've been in book publishing for 18 years. Most of our work and influence is in the American context. I know that. Uh, that's the first thing. To, again, like I said, I have to know where we are so we can know how to serve other people. But I've spent my career scouring the landscape for the things that are true across the board, across the world even. I've also worked in nearly every publishing department and partnered with dozens of organizations doing this good work all around the world. Here's what I know to be true of publishing, uh, what I know to be true in the world of publishing today. Number one, and you can see it right there on the screen, all humans are looking for meaning and help. It's still true. So our mission matters. You all have some version of a mission just like I shared uh, earlier, you all have a version of that too. Our mission matters. Everyone's looking for meaning and help. They're helping their marriage, help with their kids, help with their money, help with their, their anxiety, help with the loss of a loved one. And these are things that the Bible can help with and that we as Christian publishers can be uh, helpers with them. Our mission matters. Number two, nearly everyone is distracted <laughs> most of the time by digital devices, right? Our competition is fierce. Can I get an amen? Number three, people who read books are better off than people who don't. Our delivery system matters. There's all kinds of studies. I've, I've spent hours and hours uh, uh, researching and connecting with people who are doing research on, do books act like, does the delivery system of a book actually matter? When you hold up a book, when you read a book, when you consider the words on a page, and I'm even specifically thinking paper books here. There's a, there's a, aspect of our brain that remembers things better when we read it on a page. There's an aspect of our of our experience that causes us to be uh, untethered from our, our digital lives when we are immersed in a book, whether that's fiction or nonfiction, whether it's our Bible or a devotional, our delivery system matters. And lastly, here on this slide, God is still working today, right? This is not about how much Randall can do or how much Ramon can do or how much any of you all can do. God is working and just like it says in Proverbs, the, the Lord uses us. He prepares 
or we prepare the horse for battle, but the battle is the Lord's, right? So we prepare the horse for battle. Do you think God needs us to prepare the horses? He doesn't need us to do that, but he allows us to be a part of it. In the end, though, the battle is the Lord's. So God is still working today. It's so important that, remember, that we work like that, remember that our vision, our vision is trying to match up with his. We're not asking him to catch up with what we want to do. Uh, so given the above, what are the components of an effective publisher? If this is true for you, if you see these four things written here, and you're at least nodding a little bit with me here today uh, on a Tuesday for me here, 8 a.m., 8 in the morning, uh, if you're nodding along with me, what are the components that make an effective publisher, no matter the context? Uh, here's where I'm going to go. I think I've got six things that every publisher must understand, appreciate, and tend to. And again, before I flip here, I know that that on this call are people uh, that have a staff of three or four who are maybe your whole sales department is one person or your all your production is done by your the same person who does your marketing. Or maybe there's a staff of one and you are the publisher. Or maybe there's a staff of 20 and you've got people that are able to do different jobs in different ways. And so I'm not talking uh, just to the larger companies or just to the solo publishing shops. But if you are in the business of publishing books, if you are in the business of partnering with what God's up to today, uh, here's six things that I think uh, that I think every publisher must understand, appreciate, and tend to. Um, <clears throat> number one, so what is a publisher? What, what are we? What are the components? What makes us up? If you're thinking about a giant stew or soup and you're, you're cooking it, what, are, what is a publisher after all? Number one, we are our people. That's both our teammates who we work with and our authors. This is about our character, our skills, our teachability, our execution. So as a publisher, we are our people. This involves staying true to God, his holy word. It involves holding steadfast to him in a world that has frankly gone crazy. And we continually seek to serve the church's work of discipleship. We're unabashed about these things. We are our people. When, when you think about what the value is of a publishing company, like what is it that makes us who we are? It is who God's using to do the things that he's using in those, <clears throat> not just in our books, but our teammates and our people. Never forget that. I put this first on purpose. Uh, number two, we are our products. That is our books. Of course, that's what we do. That's the output into the world. Every day we're waking up. We're thinking about our readers. We're thinking about how we can bless them and serve them. Uh, that's our books. For us at Moody, we do about 60 Six zero sixty new books per year in print, uh, in digital ebooks, and then also in audio, uh, uh, reaching millions around the world every year. Uh, and frankly, if you want to just read audiobooks, great, or just ebooks, great. But I'll tell you, paper books for us is still the vast majority of our business, and is and still will be for many years, uh, because of I really do think there's something magic about a book. Uh, and I'll, tell, I'll talk a little more about what goes into making a great book later, uh, but we are our products. We're also our delivery systems. You all can see this. I've already, I put all six on one slide. So I'm, I'm just reading along and you're already knowing what I'm going to say. I've got no surprise. Uh, we are our delivery systems, right? This is books. Like I, I say this to our, our team, books don't do much ministry if they get dusty in our warehouse. Can I get an amen to that? So it's not just about making the books. We can make books all day, but it's about getting them out there, getting them into the world. We've got to get them out there. Uh, and for us, uh, and for many of you, you have to consider our delivery systems. Online retailers, right? Whether it's Amazon or other online distributors in your context, physical retailers, bookstores, whether they're chain stores or tiny shops that have been run by the same person for 30 years, special markets through ministries and conferences and organizations, schools and libraries, churches, businesses. We actually have a number of books that get out into the world through training uh, large corporations, even though they're Bible-centered products uh, and all around the globe. There's even new examples of channels that we've used uh, in our context to take pieces of our books and trying to get people who never will read a book. I, I don't remember the exact last stats, but some version of in, in America, and it might be different in many of your contexts, a, a very large percentage, maybe even pushing half the population is literally never gonna read a book. So how can we serve them? Considering the, the, uh, the delivery systems, 
we are also, these last three are maybe a little more, those first three are pretty obvious. The next three, we are our follow-up. We've got to keep learning and growing so we can best serve our readers. We are what we know about our customers. This is our follow-up. Which products have worked, which haven't worked. Right after this meeting today, I've got a, uh, what we call our post-analysis meeting, where we look at books that were published 12 to 14 months ago. So they've had a whole year out in the market. And we look at them. We look at the numbers. We look at who bought them. We look at what we did to sell them. Sometimes it's super fun and like a giant parade running around the office. Other times it's kind of devastating. You all know most books don't perform like we thought they would, but we must continue to learn looking at what products have worked, which haven't worked. For us, most of our business is our backlist, books that we published more than a year ago. How do we continue to add more books to that viable backlist in the past so that in the future we have a, a foundation of books and sales to, to kind of depend on? And within our follow-up, we also are how we care for our authors, right? We want authors to want to continue working with us. And we are how we care for our customers. We want to listen. Just like I mentioned earlier, D.L. Moody went to a bookstore in Wisconsin in 1892, I think 1891. And he asked that bookstore owner how it was going and what he needed to be successful. Our trade customers are our partners in the distribution of these products. Number five, we are also our ability to see into the future, right? We've kind of got to be profits a little bit. I don't know how far out you all work. We're working pretty regularly about two years out into the future, maybe a year, year and a half if we're, if, if we're speedy, sometimes three, four years out. We are looking to decide what to publish in 2025, 2026. That involves getting on our knees and asking the Lord where he's working, what he needs. What, what he's looking for from us and what we can do to help. Uh, like I said earlier, this is a 500-year-old industry that changes more every 10 years than the previous 490. Um, in the uh, considering of our ability to see in the future, we're also considering what will sell and what won't. We're not in the business to make money or to sell millions of books, but goodness, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get books out into the world. So what's going to sell? What's going to work? What might not sell very well, but we should publish convictionally and just figure out how to get the money to get them out there, even if it's for free. How can we really serve our readers? When we consider our readers, we consider three categories of church leaders, church members, and church neighbors. So how can we serve? That's for us. How can we serve our readers? That's our ability to see in the future. And lastly, um, I actually added this one later because it's not about who we are, uh, but it's our environment today. We exist in an environment. Moody Publishers exists in an environment in 2023 that is markedly different than January 2020 when we all had never heard the word COVID before, right? It's different now. And it's different than it was in 2006 before anybody heard the word iPhone before. And it's different than the word 1990 or than the year 1993 before anybody had uh, fast enough internet at their office to make a difference, right? Every decade, every generation, things are changing. We could run in panic or we could we could figure out what's next. Even Ramon made an AI joke 10 minutes ago. Goodness, who's thinking about that right now, right? So we exist in an environment. So considering these first five points, uh, we are our people, our products, our delivery systems, our follow-up and our ability to see into the future. We all exist in an environment today. Okay, so does anyone have any challenges or questions? I'm looking at... Uh, Two uh, two questions here. What does it mean? I'm going to read them from the Q&A. You all can see it oh. here. What does it mean when the publisher... Oh. Go ahead, Ramon. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. Uh, I'll do the first one here. What does it mean when the publisher turns around and says that they don't have the funds to publish the books, but later we see that they are publishing books well into the the next one next year? Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a difficult question. Um, and and honestly, from the from what I was talking about earlier, you know, as a publisher, our job is to be trustworthy. We must be. We must. Our word must matter, and we must tell the truth. I actually was having a conversation with an author of ours not too long ago that we had published before, um, but we were deciding not to publish their next book. And the temptation was to kind of 
not really say, you know, it wasn't for any bad reason. It was just for, we, we didn't really think it was a great match for us. There was nothing else going on. Uh, uh, but the temptation was for me to kind of tell a half truth or something that was nice, you know, like a nice, a nice thing to say. Uh, but in the end, I, I really needed to be upfront and clear and honest with them about, about what we were looking for and how this book wasn't a great match. And so i first of all, I'm very sorry that that experience happened for you and to you. Um, but in the end, as a publisher, I'm very convicted about this. Our job is to be upfront, honest, convicted and trustworthy. And, and that involves following the Lord and it also involves what we choose to do each day. So as you all are maybe authors or looking to be a, whether you're looking for a trustworthy partner or looking to be a trustworthy partner, you've got to be crystal clear and honest as well as, uh, as uh, kind of tell the full truth as they say, rather than just giving an, uh, a nice version or some, or even as it says here, conveniently blaming it on something that may or may not have been, been the truth. Um, next question here is in your selection of books to be published, do you have to follow your denominational beliefs that govern the majority or of Moody or do you pray about every submission that lands on your table? Well, I'll say those are actually two different questions. We do pray about every submission that lands on our table. Um, and there are a lot of them. Uh, the reality though, is we, we do have, uh, certain genres we're looking for, and we do have certain genres we're not looking for. So there are actually many times we'll get proposals sent in. Uh, and if you go to our website, you can see we actually have a long list of parameters for sending in a proposal. So for you all as a publisher, I would commend you to make your parameters very clear because I could hire five more people to, to look at all the proposals we get, and we still wouldn't be able to give an hour to each one. Uh, and so it's best to set the ground rules for potential authors very clearly. And again, you can go to our site, moodypublishers.com, just as a, as a way to look at it. And you can click through a few places and see our submission requirements, it's called. You could probably just Google Moody Publishers submission requirements and it'll take you right to that page. Um, and we actually require that the submitter follows those rules before we guarantee that we'll give them a response. It doesn't mean we won't see it, but if we are not like we are not currently looking for adult fiction as an example, and if somebody sends us their novel, we we can't have we don't have the resources to read that. We're not looking for it. We didn't ask for it. And so while we do pray about our submissions and we do pray about our guidelines and genres, um, we we can't and and aren't able to respond to everyone with with feedback. Uh, now to your other question about our denominational beliefs, well, Moody is has certain biblical convictions and and you can go actually to our site and see where our our convictions lie they're not along denominational lines uh more in line with the apostles creed uh but you can see uh that we do have convictions and we we do decide not to publish things that are outside of those convictions that's correct we are a convictional publishing house that doesn't mean that we uh think that anything we don't publish is wrong or evil, it just means that we have a certain convictional stream in that we publish in. And we also though, to be clear, we have readers all over the place. We, we are trying to reach people uh, who are way outside of our denominational or theological convictions. In fact, our best-selling books, several of our best-selling books are read by more than more non-Christians than Christians. Uh, lots of questions here. Ramon, if you could look at those and then next time we have a break, if you could ask the one or two best ones that you think would serve okay. this group best. That'd be great. Thank you, Ramon. All right. I'm gonna... Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to go to the next uh, section here. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to go briefly here. And this is mostly just because this was my role for, for the better part of a decade was in acquisitions. And so I'm going to speak about the role of an acquisitions editor, not because I think it's the most important role or because I think you all are acquisitions people. I know you're not, but what is a publishing house if we're not acquiring books, right? What are, what is our job as a publisher? So if you are listening today as a person who is the only person at your entire, you are your publishing house or you're the publisher and you have two people who work with you, but nobody has the title acquisitions editor. Somebody is looking through proposals. Somebody at your company is considering what you should publish. And so as you are in that seat, 
Uh, and if you're a bigger publisher, maybe you do have somebody with this title. But if you're in the seat of deciding what you all should publish next, in my opinion and in my experience, I think there's five keys to being able to acquire books that work and books that matter and books that last. And those are three different things. There are plenty of books that work really quickly and then die really quickly, right? And there are plenty of books that matter, but don't sell, <laughs> right? I have plenty of books that I knew matter, but didn't sell nearly nothing. And then there's books that last, which means they stick around for a long time. And those are a publisher's best friend. So as you consider the proposal stack that's sitting on your desk, as you consider your email inbox, as you consider maybe other publishers that are looking to partner with you on something they've already published, but in your context, here's five quick things that I think are very important. And they're, they're a little uh, not as necessarily intuitive, but to be successful in acquisitions, number one, you need to see a book where no book yet exists. This, this may be because you're looking at a proposal, it may be because you're speaking with an author. Maybe uh, somebody came and spoke at, a, at an event you were at and you thought that should be a book. So you need to consider the talk and how can it become a book? Or you need to consider that uh, YouTube video and how it could become a book. Or you need to consider that book proposal and maybe the book they're proposing isn't exactly what you want. I had a book proposal many years ago that was a... a a person in a in a had a certain type of job, and the book read as if it was everything I've ever learned in my job. Now, it was pretty interesting to read, but there was no audience for that because this person wasn't famous, and they were just basically saying everything they ever learned in a book. So instead, I took one chapter from that book, and it was on a topic that was a very extreme felt need, and we turned an entire book out of that one chapter, and it became a, a very strong seller for us. So number one is see a book where no book yet exists. Number two. You have to be able to assess the quality. This is about the writing quality, of course, but it's also about the theology. If you are a publisher with convictions, theological convictions, you have to kind of consider who the author is and whether you all can be trustworthy together. And, and you also have to consider the purpose of the book. You know, uh, is this book uh, uh, going to help somebody preach a sermon that's more effective? Is it going to help somebody share Christ with their next door neighbor? Is it going to help a parent whose children are, are uh, out of control. Uh, you have to consider the quality of the book uh, where it stands now. And then number three, related, you have to add quality. How as a publisher can we make this book better? I love our, our developmental editors. I, how I speak about them and with them is they're, they're closing the gap between what a book is down here and what a book could be up here, right? They're closing that gap. What What is the best version of this book? How can it be not just commercially successful, but a book that we're proud of. You got to you got to add quality. Don't just take whatever the author gives you and print it. How can we make it better for our context? For our context in Madagascar, for our context in the Philippines, for our context in 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 Texas, whatever it is. How can we add quality? Uh, number four here: be able to communicate uh, with authors. Um, our authors, and I know many of you are authors on this call, and many of you are publishers who are also authors, but our authors are the ones who I say that I make this joke to our authors. Their names are really big on the cover, right? And our name is really small on the spine. So we've got to be able to communicate with our authors, not just to help them make the book the best version that it can be, but to be an encourager, to be a bolsterer for them. They've put their heart and soul onto these pages. We have to communicate to them, about them, with them. And then lastly, be their champion. Uh, uh, the acquirer, the person who brings the book into a publishing house needs to champion the book to their team, to their sales folks, to their, uh, to their constituents, maybe to their, to the readers, to their, to their internal teammates. We've got to be excited about our books. If we're not excited about our books, nobody will be excited about our books. So as acquirers, our job is to be a project champion. Randall, uh, we are yeah. acquisitions. Uh, BP Canal of Nepal is asking, what do you do with uh, new authors? Do you give them a chance? Do you prioritize? Do you um, take a risk with new yeah. authors? Yes, I love that question. The answer to that is absolutely yes. If we don't take a risk on new authors, then we're only ever going to publish authors who've been published. And if I could see all of you right now, 
I would say, can I get a show of hands for people who are frustrated when they hear that somebody isn't taking a chance on new authors? I'm frustrated at that mm -hmm. because everybody was unpublished at some point. So how did they get a chance? Right. So now, of course, we take a chance. Now, with that said, and Ramon, I couldn't have asked for a better question as I jump into this slide right here. As we consider the elements, thank you, it's like we planned this for weeks, Ramon. <laughs> elements of a great book, as you consider, and so to the to the uh, the question asker there, BP, uh, a great idea. Think about this: a great idea executed well with an audience clamoring for it. That is the very basics of when we look at a book proposal, what we're looking for. And if you all think of it like this, think of those as three pieces of a pie. Or maybe even consider a book that you're currently publishing or your favorite book that was published somewhere else. Pretty much every book has one of these three things, right? Pretty much every book maybe is a great idea, but it wasn't written very well and there wasn't an audience clamoring for it, right? Or maybe it was very well written, but the idea wasn't very original, you know, or maybe there's an audience that wants it. Maybe it's a famous author but it's just not a very good book. So every book has one of these things, pretty much. And now most books we publish have two of them, right? A great idea executed well, but maybe the audience is tough to reach. Or maybe we have a really good book, right? Number two here uh, with an audience clamoring for it, but the idea isn't that original. Or maybe, you know, so you get it like two thirds is actually most of the books we publish. But when you get all three of these, you have a win, it's magic. You have a great original idea. You have it's it's well written. I'm not saying it's the best book ever written, but it's well written. And then there's an audience clamoring for it that we can reach. We know who they are. It's uh, parents of young children, or it's pastors of small churches, or it's um, teenagers who are wrestling with their identity. Like we know the audience, and we can reach them maybe in partnership with the author. So even if you're back to that question, if you are an unknown author who's never published before. I'll tell you, the book is almost never going to be the key to reaching your audience. You've got to practice reaching your audience now. And what's changed in publishing in the last 30 years is there are so many ways to connect with an audience. You can start a YouTube channel. You can have a podcast. You can uh, do series of tweets. You can do small speaking engagements. You can uh, self-publish a tiny ebook on Amazon. There are 40 ways. I could give a whole talk about this. There's 40 ways to reach an audience as an author before you ever get a book. And so if we have a book proposal from an author that is a great idea and executed well, but there's no audience that we can figure out how we can reach together, then all we do is publish a book that wouldn't reach anybody. Instead, our goal then is to work with that author to figure out, hey, where is your audience? Where are they? Can we help you reach them? How, tell me about your website. Tell me about your Twitter feed. Tell me about your Facebook account. Tell me about your speaking engagement, your speaking, uh, you know, uh, list. Tell me about uh, your, your network of people that you know and who trust you. Because how many of us would read a bunch of books from people that we didn't know or trust? Almost never. In the nonfiction space, you've got to know and trust the, the author. And they build that trust through building an audience. So short answer is we totally give a chance to new authors. I... I'd have to look at it, but probably of the, let's say 50 or so, 50 to 60 books we published in the last year, I'm going to say 10 to 15 of them were by people that never were never published before. Uh, that's, and that's, that's pretty average, but our goal isn't just to publish a new author and hope it works. Our goal is to publish a new author with a plan for how we think it's going to work. Does it always? Of course not, but that's the goal. All right. Any other questions there, Ramon? Um, well, I was thinking about not only just submissions, but you yourself as the publisher would go after and develop and nurture new authors. I mean, you may not have the time, but in other contexts, there are not too many submissions, but you have to take the initiative. Yes. Develop and nurture the authors. I love that. And, and uh, you're right, Ramon, depending on your context, uh, you may not have a pile of submissions that you can't get through. You might be wondering, where are all the book proposals? Um, and and then on the, on the other side, though, what we call that is proactive versus reactive acquisitions. So here in our context, 20 years ago, 
the acquisitions editor job was primarily sifting through a bin of proposals every day and finding the 2% of them that were the best. Most of them were pretty bad. A lot of them were okay, and a few of them are great. Now, these days, we still get a lot of proposals, but again, there's all kinds of reasons we wouldn't publish something, maybe because it's the wrong genre, maybe because they're theologically way over some direction that's, uh, that's not comfortable for us. Maybe it's because it's just a terrible book. <laughs> it's just not good. That's also possible. Um, but for us, we haven't found the most success there anyway. So don't be discouraged. Our books, I would say of the 50 to 60 books, new books we published last year, I'm going to say that only 10 to 15 of them came to us with a fully formed proposal, maybe 20 tops. Most of the books we publish, we proactively acquire. We have a, a, our acquiring editors are going out to, to, to conferences to see people speak. They're um, connecting with them on social media. They are following their uh, TikTok videos. They're uh, understanding their, like, we are calling up somebody. And I might say, Ramon, friend, I saw that video you made when you spoke to that group of churches about how to do evangelism more effectively today. Have you ever thought about turning that into a book? And Ramon might be like, wow, I never did. Thanks, Randall. Like, wouldn't that be encouraging to Ramon <laughs> if a publisher was coming and proactively seeking him out? And so the, the value there for us as a publisher is number one, we get to decide what we, who we are and what we become rather than hoping people send us stuff. You want to be in the driver's seat yourself. You don't want to, again, with the Lord's help, this isn't about wielding control from the Lord. This is about not just reacting to what people send you. You want to think about what type of publishing house do we want to be two or three years from now? What type of line, what type of list of books do we need? If we know that we have parents with special needs children who need to be served, then we go find them, the authors, to write for that audience. If we know that divorce is rampant or that if we know that young people aren't reading their Bibles, how can we find somebody to help meet that need? So we start with our reader, we start with the need, and then we go find an author who can help us solve it. And not just because we hope they can, but because they already are. They already are in their, in their personal ministry. They're already doing it, right? So in the end, if we publish a book from somebody that's just a good idea, but it doesn't match who they are and what they do, it's going to fall flat. That's not going to work. What does work is when we can find a need that we know our audience has and couple it with an author, potential author, who is doing the work already, and that's where the magic happens. I, I could take books off my shelf for hours and tell you the story about this one, the story about this one. And it's always an author who is doing the great work and the book can help them continue to do the great work rather than the book being the great work. Amen, amen. Thank you. All right. Really very uh, thoughtful. Um, some questions here are regarding the future trends, but I don't know if you're future, I mean, your yeah. slides, coming up slides, we might, we might tackle that question later. Yeah, um, let me, let me finish, I'll let me finish through the slides and then we can okay. have 10 or 10 or 10 more minutes or so at the end. I think that'll be the best way to do this okay. if I had to guess. So the last thing here, and I've touched on this a little bit, so I'll, I'll go pretty quickly here. In the world of information, right? How many, I mean, some of you are probably watching this on a smartphone right now. You're all watching it on a high-speed internet connection. That would have been crazy to even think about 20 years ago. The fact that we could have this many people from all around the globe speaking in real time is actually nuts, <laughs> right? And so here we are, though, the critical transaction for all of us, no matter our context, is an author reaching his or her readers. If we don't do that, we're not doing our jobs. So how can we make that happen? Um, again, here's this is a lot of information. Uh, don't feel that you need to... Uh, uh, you know, copy it all or, or, or do everything. Uh, but here's, <laughs> here's the situation. I know of 400 person publishing machines and I know of one person publishing houses. Most of us are in the middle, right? Raise your hand if you're in the middle of those two things, probably most of us. But the most effective teams make every role's part in the reaching of readers crystal clear. So as we reach our readers, we all know this, and this is this is what adds up to selling a lot of books, right? So we can stay in business, but it also adds up to the life change that we're looking for. 
none of us are doing what we're doing to make a bunch of money. None of us are doing what we're doing to be famous. None of us are doing what we're doing because it was the easiest way to make a living, right? Come on. We're all doing what we're doing because we believe in the mission, because we believe that the Great Commission is real, that Jesus gave us a clear call, and that the harvest is ready. And we're up to this. And so as whatever your job is, wherever you are, an editor's job is to, like I talked about, is to make that gap between the author and the reader shorter. Great designers help a reader picture a third dimension in their reading experience. The best acquirers understand the readers and go looking for the content they need, right? Marketing and sales, whatever that is, whatever your version of marketing and sales is, I, I always say it's basically marketing and sales job is to make the demand evident for the book and then make sure the books are where people can find them. They have the ultimate role of connecting real products with real people. This is so hard. It's so much harder to sell one book than it was 30 years ago. <laughs> and it's not getting easier, but it's worth it. Keep doing it. The work you're doing matters and it's possible. If you're an accountant, great. You got to help us make sure this is financially viable. If you're a customer service professional, guess what? You might be thinking, Randall, I wish we had a customer service department. You do. We're all in customer service. The entire thing is customer service. That's what we're doing. And technology experts help the reader relationship to go to new heights in our digital age. So uh, last couple of thoughts here. If the job of a publisher is to connect a reader with the book, then what we need to do is remove the barriers. If you're an editor, make it simpler. Remove clunky language. If that 190 page book can be 140 pages, do it, <laughs> right? If that three book series can be one book, do it, make it. Everything on the internet is shorter. And that does, I, I love books, don't get me wrong, but remove the clunky language. If you're a theologian, make the gospel clear. Don't make it weird or hard, make it clear. If you're a production person, make the book accessible. If you're a salesperson, make the book available. If you're the person who decides what to publish, most of all, make sure it's worthwhile for the reader. They are trusting you with their money. They are trusting you with their time. Don't waste it. <laughs> because here's how best-selling books, do you guys know best-selling books don't happen because of a huge marketing budget or a famous TV show or somebody who's TikTok famous? Best-selling books happen because Ramon read a book and told his friend John. And then John read the book and told his friend Dahlia. Dahlia read the book, told David, and then Don, and then Ephraim, and then Gary, and then Inga, and then Jeff, and then Joshin, and then Justin, right? That's how great books work and how best-selling books happen. It's because they matter and they were worthwhile. And we tell our friends. That's what we're in the business of doing. And so keep doing it. Last thoughts here. We found all across the world that while bestsellers jump out of the gate, when bestsellers jump out of the gate and make a ton of money, that's great. Can I get a show of hands for how often that happens? Pretty much never, right? <laughs> Instead of aiming at a target this that's this big and feeling like a failure when we don't hit it, our goal should be to wield our team to head toward books that can be long-term winners over a long period of time, right? Many publishers, and I'm not, maybe it's some of you all, maybe it's none of you all, but many publishers are trying to make a book sell as many copies as possible in like 90 days. That stresses me out. I would never sleep if that's what I was trying to do. I'm, I'm trying to make books that are going to last for years and decades. That doesn't mean they'll never need to be updated or maybe the cover will look weird in a decade. We'll fix that. But when we're looking for books that are going to matter for a long time, like the main book, what's our main book? The Bible. Has it mattered for a long time? Yes. The Bible's a unique character in the story, of course, but we're trying to get people to read the Bible. We're trying to get people to follow the Lord. We're trying to get people to desire the things of heaven rather than things of earth. That's not going to look like a very quick bestseller, usually, every once in a while, maybe, but usually not. So these, what do these types of books look like? They look like category leader books that are helping a niche audience, right? Think about the extremely niche needs of your readers in your context. This doesn't need to be a famous author. Maybe it's a counselor writing about um, depression. Maybe it's a, uh, a Bible scholar writing about uh, the, the difficulties in a, in a certain context related to idolatry or uh, uh, witchcraft, or maybe it's uh, 
a uh, a person who understands the local church writing about the difficulties of of meeting when it's illegal to do so, right? These are category leaders in a niche space, having evergreen content that won't get dated. Don't try to write for right now because by the time you publish it, it'll already be old. What are people always caring about? What are big topics with a unique vantage point? Like, ooh, I never thought about it like that. That is interesting. People like that. And then uh, uh, to the question from earlier, do we tr do we work with new authors? Yes. Sometimes we, we, call, we talk about buying a future, which is basically thinking this author may not be ready for prime time right now, but we can see in the next five and 10 years, they're going to, they're going somewhere. So we want to work with them. And we also publish our existing authors because when you publish book two from an author, you also sell book one. When you publish book three, you also sell book one and two, right? Uh, and then long-term publishing. This is bigger projects that might be a Bible commentary or maybe a, a dictionary of some kind, or maybe a highly illustrated thing. These are things that take a long time, frankly, cost a lot of money. And you have to make those bets much more carefully. Um, but I believe every publisher within whatever means we, we've been given should always have one or two long-term projects going because those are the projects that last the longest and that kind of become those big rocks for us as a publisher. And again, I know those we've done books, one book that costs 10 times as much as a normal book, but if it's done right, it can last 10 times as long and be a, a critical regular income for us in the long run. So those long-term publishing projects are worth it, even if they feel a little risky uh, in the end. Uh, hold on here, sorry. All right, lastly, I believe the parable of the talents explains pretty much everything. And it's no doubt that God has blessed you all. Each of you is an inspiration to me, honestly. Guys, I was crying before the meeting started and I was like, how am I supposed to present? There's so many people here who are doing such good work that I would love to hear an hour each from each of you. Um, the church, you are an inspiration to me. The church as a whole is an inspiration with so many talents. God has given, I was in Singapore with many of you about five years ago and was so encouraged to hear of the work that the Lord was doing all over the church, all the, that the Lord was doing all over the world through his church and through you all. Keep doing it. Our goal, just like in the parable of the talents, our goal at Moody, your goal at your publishing house, with you, with your authors for the kingdom is to double whatever we've been given for the king. This is, it's doable and you guys are doing it. You are an encouragement to me, keep at it. I know there's so much, there's big questions and there's little questions, but be blessed today as you go about doing what the Lord has for you. Thank you so much, Randall. Can you, can you flip to the, uh, remove the barrier slide? Yep, hold on. Yeah, so remove barriers. So there's one question here from Hankuri. How do you improve? And, you know, a, a not too excellent manuscript. So, of course, the editor, <laughs> that's an answer. Yeah. Question. Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, if if you can work with the author while they're writing, that's the best. So we don't like accepting manuscripts that are done. I would much rather have a proposal and a sample, and then we decide to work with the author, and then they write the book over the course of a year or so. And so that is way better because then we can speak into it. They can send us a chapter at a time, and we can coach them and help them. And then when they write chapter two and we make some edits, then they can write chapter three in a different way. Versus if they've written the whole book and the whole thing needs a lot of work, then there's a lot of time's been wasted there. So ideally, you have you are speaking into the manuscript as it's being written. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that the world is not ideal. So very often we do get a manuscript that is not what we want it to be. In that case, I recommend having a few different readers, whether it's at your publishing house, people in the audience, right? So if you can have two or three expert readers who are maybe on staff or even family members or people that can speak into a manuscript so it's not just one editor dealing with one author and who's, you know, who's going to win. It's like, hey, do we have different people that can speak into this manuscript? Because sometimes the issue may be a language problem. I mean, it's like, it's just not very good writing. Well, then you need a good editor and everybody needs a good editor. Other times though, it's the writing's fine, but maybe the, the flow or the, the, the points that are being made are confusing 
And so that to me is really a bigger picture acquisition situation where you want to be speaking with the author about the points they're making and always keep the reader in mind. Because if you lose the reader, it's not going to work. You, you maybe sold them one book. How many of us have started reading a book and didn't finish it more than halfway through? I mean, everybody, right? Because life's too short to read bad books. So if you have published a book that doesn't keep the reader's attention, maybe you sold them a book, but they're not going to be an evangelist for you. And that book is not going to go then to their friend and then to their friend and then to their church. So you, it is our job as a publisher to close the gap and make the book the best version of itself, whatever it can be, do it. And then it takes time. So another thing that we've had to do uh, in past years, we've actually published more books than we do now. And we decided to publish fewer books so that we could spend more time on each one. And actually what's happened is we sold more copies of the books that we then do, right? So we can spend more time making each book the best version of itself, which is what if whatever your ministry time, business and money can handle, we want to spend more time making the books the best version of themselves because we spend so much time, energy and money on each one of these books. And if it, if it goes out into the world and it's unfinished, it's not going to reach the people that we want it to. Uh, Don Tan is asking about pricing. So this is not it acquisitions, but more on financial sustainability. So how do you price your books? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. We consider the marketplace, right? We consider the competition to, to some extent, but we also have to consider our costs and who we're sharing with. Like there's, there's all kinds of um, costs that go into making a book and then Discounting that happens when you sell a book to different partners. So we kind of have, we have a, uh, a feasibility model where we consider how many we think we're going to sell, what the price point of it will be, what kind of discounts we'll give on it, how much it's going to cost us to make the book. And then we, and it spits out more or less how many we need to sell to break even. And so if that number is too high, then we maybe don't publish the book or maybe we charge more for it. Now there are uh, the market in the end, the market dictates how much a book should be, right? We've published books because we spent too much to make them. And then we overcharged for the book and actually hurt ourselves because then we didn't sell enough. So in the end, our, our goal, where possible, we try to keep it cheaper. So if we're choosing between two prices, we want to make it as accessible as possible for the reader um, and, and keep price from being a barrier wherever possible. Now, with that said, we have to make a living and we have to stay in business. So it isn't about free books for everyone. And, and there's another reason for that too, is because if we know this from the world of eBooks where you can, we can give away eBooks very easily, right? Like put it for free for a week or something. And you think, wow, we got 5,000 books out into the world for free. Now, it, you know, we didn't make money on it, but we're in ministry. So we're happy to do that. But we know that very few of those books actually get read. Mm -hmm. So where we're not trying to rip people off, never want to do that. We know that if somebody hands over some amount of money for a book, even if it's a small amount for a business, but even if it's a large amount for the reader, right? That transaction hurts a little bit, a little bit. And then they're going to read the book. So if I get a book for free, if I get a stack of books for free at a conference versus I have a stack of books I paid my, my own money for, which ones am I going to read first? It's going to be the ones that I paid my own money for. So you need to charge money for your books. It's important. You're doing good work. Make your books worth the money you're charging for them. That's excellent point, Randall. Make your books worth the money they, the, the buyers are paying for. Uh, what about the future, Randall? How, how do you, any trends or anything that you... <laughs> yeah. So for the future. Yeah. yeah, I can say a couple things and I know where time is short. So I want to, I want to honor you all in your time. Some of you probably are getting ready to go to bed. Ramon and I are just getting started. You should, Ramon and I, are, we're just about three miles from each other right now. So that's pretty funny. We're speaking from all over the world, but we're right down the street uh, from each other. Um, certainly some future talk is all related to context. So the future in certain parts of the world is going to look different than the future in other parts of the world. So I couldn't, 
even begin to speak to certain contexts and what you all are facing and what you might face. Um, for us, some of the talk, certainly artificial intelligence is a big thing that's here and coming and trying to figure out how to navigate that as a publisher. Um, another thing that's happening is audiobooks and ebooks are both larger parts of business for us, but audiobooks are becoming more popular than ebooks even now. And so that's an interesting thing to think about people listening on their ear pods, right? More than reading with their eyeballs meaning they can do other things. Because if you're listening to an audiobook, you can drive a car or mow a lawn or, you know, um, uh, do something else versus when you're reading with your eyeballs, you can't really multitask. So there's there's some, some parts of that that are interesting. Um, more though, for all of us, I honestly believe it's not going to get any easier to do what we're doing. I think it's only going to keep getting harder, whether that's for financial reasons or physical danger or uprisings or difficulties or supply chains or pandemics like it's not going to get easier so what we need to do is stick together and take heart follow the lord ask for his guidance stay true to him stay involved in the local church <laughs> and be encouraged it's not going to get easier to do what we do i'm not suggesting that it's going to be miserable but we all do this because of, of our love for the lord and our love for books so keep at it it's it's going to keep getting more difficult um but since our hope is in the Lord and since we do see real fruit of our labors with these books, keep doing it. It's worth it. Well, one of the keeping your eyes and ears open and continue to focus on your mission as a publishing house. Yeah. So uh, Trix is asking, how do you listen to your audience? How do you listen are you yeah. open to ideas? Are you? Yes. Yeah. So we listen to our audience. The main way we do that is, well, there's a few. You've got to cultivate email lists. I understand different contexts and different things. But if you have an email list, even if it's 100 people, grow it and, and cultivate it and communicate with them because they'll tell you not just what they want from you, but also what they thought of what you gave them earlier. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you get we ought not be afraid of feedback in, in 25 minutes here. I'm headed to a meeting that I said our, our post publication analysis meeting. It's all very sounds very official, but really it's us looking at books that are a year old and seeing if they worked. And a lot of how we know if they work is their sales. Right. Of course. But also the reviews that we got and the feedback that we got. Did it actually serve an audience? Maybe we thought we were going to sell twice as many of something. And so technically. Financially, it might have been a failure, but ministry-wise, the feedback we got, the book totally worked. So then what do we do with that? We need to figure out how to do it more cheaply next time or more effectively so that we don't lose money on it because we still want to have done the book to serve people. So the main way we listen to our audience, some, some social media, that's difficult to keep up with. Um, the other way we do it is through our authors because a publishing house is important and some publishing houses are very well known, but most publishers aren't, right? If you all consider whatever book you're reading right now, can you tell me the publisher of it, right? Maybe, maybe not. Now we're in Christian publishing, so maybe you, you can a little more than average, but most people don't know who published something. They know who wrote it. They know the author. So yeah. we keep tabs with our audience, with our authors. So we regularly communicate with our authors about what they're hearing and what they know and what their readers are saying. We had a series of meetings last week in Chicago with a number of our authors in person. It was great. We hadn't done this in years. And we were talking with them about what they should write next based on what they've heard from their readers. And it was my one of my favorite weeks I ever had. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the ways to remove the barriers between you know getting feedback is to intentionally solicit feedback. Uh, like some publishers would with the QR code at the end. Yes. And this, um, give us feedback. Tell us how we bless you or we missed something in this in this um, manuscript or in this book that we, you know, we didn't include this aspect. So give us, you know, they're trying to remove the barrier and, and let the, yes. the open communication between the publisher and, and the reader. So be intentional. That that's great. And even within the book itself, that's very smart, whether it's a QR code or just an email address at the back or the front of the book. Tell us what you thought, you know, because if you don't ask, you won't hear. Uh-huh. 
That's correct. All right. Thank uh, you, Ramon. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Randall. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's very uh, helpful, inspirational, informative. That's what some of our audience uh, wrote in their comments. Thank you for appreciating the webinar today. And we hope that this will really be helpful. You can go back and review and I will send you, Randall, we are okay with sending your slides to our, uh, all our registered yes, sir. students, right? Yes, I wanna bless you all as best as possible. Thank you for your time. You all have so encouraged me today. I just want you to know the Lord's with you. He loves you. And we are in this game together here in, in Christian Book Publishing. I'm so delighted to be with you in it. Thank you so much, um, Randall. Well, thank you, everyone. Before we leave, I have some a few announcements here. Um, yeah, some some announcements from MAI. Yes, so our next webinar is on AI. I mean, helpful and practical AI tools for Christian writers and publishers. So AI is very much, you know, it's it's so fast growing and we somehow can't keep up with AI, but we hope to be able to share with you some practical tools on, on AI. Uh, tools for Christian writers and publishers. It's not too late to come to Lit Africa. Uh, it's on November 5 to 9 in Botswana. If you're still thinking about joining the conference, please do uh, go to our website. There is a register, click on register. And I'll ask the audience to please pray for Lit Africa, it's coming up on November 5 to 9. And if you're in Asia, we would like to invite you to join the Lit Asia Conference. Yeah, so it's in Bangkok and um, no, April 7 to 11, publishing hope uh, in, in hard times. Uh, please uh, consider coming to Lit Asia. Um, April 7 to 11, 2024, the spring of next year. And of course, our main, um, our main conference is Lit World. It's, it will be, I don't know why it's uh, not moving. My slide is not moving, but it's going to be, yes, it's going to be in Mexico. So Lit World, the next Lit World, is going to be in Puebla, Mexico, Publish, Publishing for Lasting Impact. That's the theme. So please uh, mark your calendar, save the date, and and uh, yeah, be excited. And if you have not been to a lit world, Randall, you've been to a lit world before. Yeah, so would you recommend, would you? Of course, yes, you all should go. It was. <laughs> One of the highlights of my professional career to see you all, be with you all, understand the different challenges and excitements going on around the world. I've, I've never felt more a part of the global church than I did when I was at Lit World. Yes, sir. That's November 3 to 8 of 2024. And if you have not signed up to subscribe to our newsletters, Word for the World, uh, there's a QR code there. You can scan it and 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 register and uh, sign up to receive our uh, newsletters. Our mission is to help come alongside Christian writers and publishers around the world so they can create excellent content that, content, content that will impact the church and society. So thank you so much, Randall, again, for leading us in our webinar this morning, today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you again next month for our webinar. In the meantime, the Lord bless you and keep you. And keep writing and keep publishing excellent Christian books. Good day and God bless everyone.